Hi, welcome to Chavista Chronicles from Caracas. This is episode number two. My name is Jesus Rodriguez, and this week I want to talk about economy, impunity, security, anti chavismo and Venezuelan politics, and some international issues that are relevant this week. Uh, this week, if you ask me, has been a very slow week for Venezuelan standard, but in comparison to any other country, that might be a very busy week. But anyways, I'm going to the first issue, the economy. Uh, the things that I want to highlight the most uh, in this regard is inflation. This week, Venezuelans have been, we have been suffering uh, an increase of prices connected to the devaluation that we mentioned in the previous podcast. I mean, we have been suffering three weeks of devaluation of the bolivars in front of the dollar. And uh, this week, we start feeling the uh, increase of prices, and that thing is driving Venezuelans crazy. And, of course, that put up a lot of pressure uh, on the government, on Maduro's government. If you ask me, I believe that that's why he uh, made the announcement of appointing seven new ministers this week. Most of them are connected to uh, to, to economic uh, ministers or ministers con uh, connected with economic activities. So let's see what happened. The announcement itself is positive, but it's not enough. I mean, Venezuelans are in need of starting more efficiency. And everyone knows, at least the Chavistas, we know that not everything is connected to uh, efficiency itself, that also the international blockade, the U.S. sanctions are relevant in, in the performance of the Venezuelan economy. But let's see if we start also uh, improving the quality of our uh, public servants in trying to solve the problems that we have. So we hope that this new cabinet uh, improves the economic situation of the country. But at the same time, we know that the blockade is affecting the country, and that takes us to an issue that I wanted to highlight, which is the soybean vessel retained in the Panama Canal or around the Panama Canal. That doesn't matter. I mean, the thing that I wanted to highlight there was that, that this vessel was retained, disregarding whatever the mainstream media said uh, about it or the right-wingers said about it, uh, around the Panama Canal, it doesn't mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that was detained by the Panama Canal authorities or not. The issue is that uh, the vessel was stopped because the insurance company didn't want to issue the insurance because the destination port was in Venezuela, and because of the sanctions, they didn't want to risk being sanctioned by the U.S. government, and that's part of what the blockade means. So everyone should be aware of that, and everyone should be aware. That that's how the sanctions work. I mean, they put pressure on private companies or corporations or whatever that are doing business with Venezuela openly or not very openly. And, of course, that uh, strangle or add to the suffocation of the Venezuelan people. So we need to be very aware of that and, 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 and put pressure uh, in trying to release the sanctions. Talking about impunity, I wanted to talk about the, uh, that issue because that connects to some things that we uh, mentioned in the previous podcast. And basically this week what happened is that uh, the Constituent Assembly leaked the parliamentary impuni immunity to three opposition deputies uh, that were connected to crimes. Uh, but uh, the problem is that the three of them flee to Colombia. So for one side, it's nice that the uh, Constituent Assembly uh, opened the possibility for a legal procedure uh, against those deputies, but from the other side, the guys flee the country, so the impunity issue is still around there. Uh, uh, but also the controller this week sanctioned several opposition activists and operators connected to Guaido, I mean, uh, basically, uh, he sanctioned, the general controller sanctioned a executive from CITGO and PDAVESA that were appointed by Guaido. And that's a positive outcome. Let's see what happened around that issue. So those are the most relevant things in connection to the impunity issue that I mentioned a lot last week. 
Uh, then we have to talk about security issues, and that takes us to the Oribe assassination attempt that Maduro basically announced a few days ago that uh, in Colombia, Uribe was planning or was training 32 uh, paramilitary to be sent to Venezuela in order to uh, to assassinate President Maduro. So that's, uh, that's something that was denounced by President Maduro a few days ago, and let's see what happened. It's something that is in development, is developing currently, um, but it's something that is happening right now, I mean. Uh, but also that connects us to uh, an announcement that Ivan Duque, the president of Colombia, said that he wanted to talk about Venezuela in his speech in, in next September in the uh, United Nations uh, Assembly, General Assembly. So let's see what happened, but this is funny because a country like Colombia, full of problems, economical, political, security problems, uh, he wants to distract the attention of everyone about the issues of Colombia and talk about Venezuela. Also, another important security issue uh, raised by Russia a few days ago was this announcement of uh, uh, paramilitary forces being trained in a United Kingdom base in Guyana, uh, in which there were already Venezuelans being trained to promote terrorist acts in Venezuela. That's a thing that we have to keep an eye on it, especially because we were trying to find some replies from the Guyana's government in relation, or from the Guyanese media in relation to this issue. And we barely found one or two pieces, not very substantiated, uh, and that somehow raised the alarms about uh, the possibility uh, of this announcement uh, made by Maria Zaharova from Russia. Uh, uh, the, I mean, we believe that is something that we have to keep an eye on it. Another important security issue is the Ticoporo massacre, uh, the massacre that happened a few weeks ago in Barinas State, in which six peasants were killed, Chavista activist peasants were killed, and there's a, an announcement made by the CICPC, which is a law enforcement agency in Venezuela, and the head of that uh, agency in Barinas State, a few days after the massacre, uh, he announced the capture of one person in connection to the massacre, and the problem is that he posted it uh, on Twitter, and in the same post, he basically said that the, the massacre was in connection to a problem between this guy and a, a group of criminals that he's connected with and the six Chavistas compañeros that were killed in Barinas State. So this is something that we posted a few days ago in Orinoco Tribune and we raised attention and we re remarked that that's something that needed to be uh, paid attention to because we know that there is a lot of corruption and that the landlords can pay and 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 corrupt these you know police agencies in order to to do whatever they need them to do to cover their atrocities. So I believe that we need to keep an eye on it. Uh, this is not a problem that is already solved, and and the Glassdoor organizations in Venezuela are 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 following very carefully this situation. Uh, also, talking about the politics in Venezuela, the anti-Chavismo politics, the opposition politics, it's important to highlight that the divisions between uh, anti-Chavismo is more evident than ever. This last week, there was this skirmish between Maria Corina Machado and Capriles Radonsky in was the Republic, and it showed how divided the opposition is. Also, uh, it's also important to highlight that you, at least we have been starting to see for the last two or three weeks, like in, in, in media, Venezuelan media, TV and radio, which is mostly controlled by right-wingers, like private companies, uh, like uh, some positions moving from the extremes to the middle, to the consensus approach, to the approach in which Chavista 
and, and opposition people might see and try to discuss the problems of the country. And if you ask me, that's something that I see in a very positive way because uh, that might mean that the, the right-wingers that control the media in Venezuela are realizing that the extremist position that they were promoting, I mean, for always, but most recently between January and April, has been like wearing out somehow. So that, that's something positive that is needed to be highlighted. And uh, also it's important to mention in this uh, part that uh, Diosdado Cabello uh, made the announcement of starting the possibility of having parliamentary elections soon. So that creates a lot of noise in the mainstream media. Uh, and a few days later, uh, President Maduro announced that he wanted those parliamentary elections very soon. So let's see what happened. If you ask me, uh, I believe that that's something that, that uh, the Venezuelan government wants, but, but it's somehow connected to the Norway talks. And that takes us to the international and last issue that we want to talk about, which is the Norway talks. A few days ago, Jorge Arraza made the announcement that we decided to uh, stop talking with the opposition. I mean, the decision that President Maduro took a few days ago was to stop sending the delegation to uh, Barbados to, for the Norway talks uh, because as a result of the of the sanctions and uh, the blockade uh, announced by President Trump against Venezuela. So in this uh, statement made by Arriaza a few days ago, he basically said that Venezuela didn't decide to stop the participating in negotiations, um, but we wanted, in order to participate in, in I mean, in, in, re in order to resume our participation in, in peace talks and negotiations with the opposition, we wanted to have more clear rules uh, in order to avoid not having a new set of sanctions uh, imposed on us the day after we resumed the talks, or having the, the U.S. you know uh, fleet in front of Venezuela blocking Venezuela the day after we decide to to resume the talks. So, so that's basically what uh, Chancellor Riaza said a few days ago. And I believe that is important, especially because it was uh, in the media already that there, uh, there was a delegation from the Norway, Norwegian government in Venezuela trying to make some sort of agreements between the government and the opposition. So if you ask me, I believe that eventually in the next year we're going to see some announcement made in terms of trying to resume negotiations. But as I told you, Venezuelan government is going to do that only if some clear rules in terms of, you know, at least stopping uh, a new runs of sanctions or aggressions against Venezuela, uh, I mean, should be uh, made. So let's see what happened in this respect. And, uh, and of course, that connects to the parliamentary elections a scenario in which I believe the Venezuelan government is trying to put, use it as a pressure also to to to, to put some sort of pressure in the negotiation table. And just to finish, I wanted to highlight that a lot of Venezuelans and progressives, if you ask me, around the world were very happy by the results of the PASO elections in the primary elections in Argentina and the victory of Kirchnerismo and, and, and Peronismo. And, uh, and we are very optimistic about that. We That give us some sort of fresh air thinking that maybe there's the possibility of having the left taking uh, positions of power in, the, in, in, in this part of the world in recent months. So we are very optimistic about that, and we believe that, that if that happens, that will be very helpful for you know, the balance of power uh, that is currently uh, not in favor of Venezuela. So let's see what happened about that. And this is basically what I wanted to mention this in this podcast uh, un abrazo fuerte desde Caracas and we hope to see you next week here in Chavista Chronicles from Caracas please help us spread the word about this podcast 
and about the work that we uh, do in Orinoco Tribune trying to provide additional information about Venezuela. Un abrazo grande. Bye-bye.